Hi everybody, my name is Dougal, it's like uh, Google with a D, and I'm really excited to be here, it's my first ICFP. Uh, my background actually is uh, physics and, and later machine learning, and so as a result of that I spent a lot of time uh, writing in MATLAB. Um, and it's easy from a modern PL perspective to look down on MATLAB and NumPy, they do seem so backward. Uh, but I actually don't think we've come up with a viable alternative yet, and it's kind of on us as the PL and compilers community to do that. The good news is though I think we're getting pretty close, and uh, in this talk I want to describe what I think still some of the uh, outstanding problems are, and the progress that we've been trying to make towards this uh, in this experimental language called DEX. The idea of the MATLAB model is you have a flexible, dynamically typed host language like MATLAB or Python, and you use it to string together a fixed set of high-performance kernels. And this can work really well, actually. First, it gives you easy access to hardware accelerators like GPUs and TPUs. You can have the best CUDA program in the world to implement a super-fast MATML, and if that's where your flops are, then you're going to go as fast as the hardware can possibly go. It also plays really well with automatic differentiation, or AD. What's nice about these primitive sets that you tend to see is that they're closed under differentiation. For example, the derivative of a matmol is also a matmol. So the parallelism in performance that you had in the original program translates perfectly over to the derivative program. And this is in contrast to traditional imperative AD in, in Fortran and C, where getting parallel derivatives is still an active research area. This also turns out to be surprisingly hard to get right in functional array languages, for example, DEX and so I'll have more to say about this a bit later. Now, another important strength of the MATLAB model is that it works really well as an embedded DSL in an existing host language. So there's no need to design your own language from scratch and build an entire compiler for it. But we're all programming languages enthusiasts and uh, we actually love doing that kind of stuff. So I'm actually gonna move this over to the bad column. Now, there's another interesting feature of the MATLAB model, which is that you often end up with really terse code because of this feature called rank polymorphism. I think it comes from APL. The idea is that each of your built-in operators comes with its own map. So if you want to, say, apply a matrix multiplication to several matrices at once, you can do that with a single call to the MATML operator, and you just give it a higher dimensional argument and it maps over all of the subarrays. This is going to be a controversial opinion, but I actually see rank polymorphism as more of a bug than a feature. You're forced to have it in an implementation of the MATLAB model because it's the only way to express a map. You don't have a map combinator at the top level. Um, but it actually forces users to organize code in, in an unnatural way. You have to carry around batch dimensions everywhere. You've got to push all your loops to the inside. Um, I agree that it is nice to be able to add two vectors with the same operation that you use to add two scalars or two matrices. But an ordinary type class system handles that perfectly. Now moving on to the con column. We've already talked about rank polymorphism, shape errors, uh, indexing errors. These are a huge pain point in MATLAB programming. We'd love to have a type system to catch these. And actually, more than that, we'd love to be able to have a type system to help us reason about them and uh, document them. If you look at MATLAB or NumPy code, it's always full of comments describing the shapes of different variables. And these things should just be type annotations. It's a no-brainer. But the big one really is about expressiveness. In a proper higher order array combinator language, you at least expect to be able to do map, reduce, and some kind of sequential scan or fold. In the MATLAB model, you get map only via rank polymorphism, and we've discussed the limitations there. You get reduce through some small set of reduction operators like summation and product, and you get sequential scan only by falling back to the host language, and in that case, you face a massive performance cliff. So can we have the good parts of the MATLAB model without the bad? That's really been the goal of DEX. We wanted a language that was easy to compile to GPU, uh, has AD built in, and then also has a static type system for shape and indexing errors. I think the easiest thing to do now is just to show you what it looks like so far. So on the right, I just have Emacs, and on the left, just going to start up the DEX notebook. And what this is going to do is it's going to watch the file for changes and run it uh, every time it changes. To give you a flavor of the syntax, let's just uh, abstract this into a function. Okay, so far everything looks like an ordinary functional language. After Hello World, the next conventional program is factorial, so let's try that. Well, that failed, and the reason is that DEX doesn't have recursion, doesn't have recursive functions, doesn't have recursive ADTs. Functional programming traditionally is built around recursion, and so how do we do anything interesting without it? The answer is that we use iteration instead of recursion, and we use arrays instead of recursive ADTs. So let's take a look at how arrays work in DEX. 
We saw an example before of an array literal, so let's make one of those. Uh, we can print it out and we can query its type. So here's the first time we see something a little bit different. This array has a type that looks a bit like a function, but instead of the an ordinary single arrow, we have this uh, double arrow. And uh, what this is saying is that uh, an array is really a mapping from the index set. In this case, the index set is fin4, finite4, the set of uh, elements 0, 1, 2, and 3, to integers. And actually, this uh, analogy between arrays and functions, we, uh, we, we carry it uh, all the way through. So for example, a higher dimensional array, if we made this a nested array, we see it's just like a binary function, in fact, a curried binary function. And of course, we could also have the uncurried form. Um, so let's explore this uh, analogy even further. So now let's take a closer look at functions, which is something we're very familiar with. Um, one thing I've learned is that PL is a lot like uh, quantum field theory and that everything is described in terms of creation and annihilation operators or introduction and elimination forms. And so for functions, we have the introduction form, which is lambda, and we have the elimination form, which is function application, and we have the, the function type. And we can make the same sorts of things for arrays. So we can now ask what are the corresponding forms for arrays or tables. We've already seen the type of arrays, uh, which is completely analogous to the type of function, just the index set type and the element type. Um, the elimination form is clearly just indexing. Um, but what about the analog of lambda? Um, reasoning completely by analogy, we can just create one. So we'll call it uh, for. So for i and then somebody. This sort of thing is sometimes called build in array common data languages. But the idea is that uh, this constructs an array whose uh, elements are the result of evaluating the body of the expression at each of the valid indices. And when I say valid indices, that already uh, highlights one important difference between functions and arrays, and that's that the domain of arrays, the index set, really has to be a finite thing that you can enumerate exhaustively so that you can build uh, an array. So uh, the array type um, is actually constrained index to be, have an index set uh, type class associated with it, which means that it's finite and uh, enumerable. Now one thing about working with functions that we're familiar with as functional programmers is there's often two styles of working with functions. There's the pointful style and the point-free style. So to illustrate these, let's see some examples. If we wanted to uh, flip the order of arguments of a function, um, the point-free style would just be to use a higher order function, uh, there's one called flip. Whereas the point full style is to use an explicit lambda and explicit uh, binders and variables. And we can actually do exactly the same thing uh, with arrays, of course. In the case of arrays, the analog of flipping the arguments of function is uh, swapping the indices of an array, so transposing the array. So let's call it transpose. The title of our paper was a pun on getting to the point. Uh, and in some ways, the point of DEX is that it's often quite natural to write array programs in this pointful style. Um, whereas the traditional MATLAB APL style of array programming doesn't really give you access to it. The only way to transpose an array is to use a built-in function called transpose. Um, so it's as if you were, you were being asked to do functional programming and you had to do it entirely in uh, point-free style. Point-free style can be a very appropriate choice in many situations. Um, but of course you'd rather have both point-free and pointful styles available to you so you can use whichever is, is appropriate at the moment. Uh, so now let's actually, let's actually implement these for real just to see them uh, working. Uh, so we can print the types and values and we can see uh, it works just like you'd expect. Here I wrote the types on the binders and for very explicitly. But just as with, with, uh, with Lambda, if they're obvious enough for the context, it's perfectly acceptable to leave them out. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to show what sort of type error you get if you get the indexing wrong. So let's imagine uh, we wrote this type signature for transpose, but we wrote x.jj instead of xji. Uh, this is the error you get. It's a completely static error. We haven't actually applied transpose to anything yet. This is just when you've defined the function. And I'd argue that's a, that's a pretty reasonable error. Let's take a look at uh, how you might sum over different axes of this two-dimensional array in this pointful style. So if you wanted to uh, so if you wanted to sum the columns together and if you wanted to sum the rows then of course you would do it the other way around. But what if you wanted to sum all of the elements in the array? One thing about the approach in DEX is that we're quite flexible 
in what we consider an index set. So these fin n uh, index sets are index sets, but you can also have things like tuples of index sets. Anything that can plausibly implement the index set type class is a valid index set. So in this case, what we can do is uh, we can write sum of for ij as a tuple uh, sum data dot i dot j. Uh, and you see that sums all the elements. If you ask for the type of this uh, of this thing, it's essentially the array analog of an uncurried function. Instead of being a nested array, it's a single flat one-dimensional array whose indices happen to be pairs of indices. So this index polymorphism lets you play a lot of fun games. You can imagine going further and uh, and having index sets that are some types or even index sets that are tables, which give you exponentially sized arrays. And there's all sorts of uh, uh, crazy things that people are, are playing with there. Now, I still haven't explained how we survive without recursion. Remember, we at least want to be able to do reduction and sequential iteration, and so far it only looks like we can do map with, with this for construct. One approach would be to add a bunch more combinators, and that's the second order array combinator approach. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to add side effects to the language, but we're going to make sure that our side effects are very explicit in the type system so that the compiler can reason about them. So let's take a look again at the array function analogy. Our effect system is roughly based on cokers, so function application can produce effects and uh, function definition lambda doesn't produce effects it's pure with arrays though the situation is the exact opposite so indexing is cheap and pure but array building this for expression uh, it's expensive potentially because it builds an array but also it can have side effects it, it sequences effects so this for is actually looking less like a map and it's more like map m or traverse it has sequential semantics but the compiler can still parallelize it if it can prove that it will generate the same result. So to do uh, reduction, we just need some sort of writer effect, or we call it actually the accumulator effect. And if it's associative and the compiler knows about it, then we can still parallelize it. To do sequential iterations, we just use a state effect. Now finally, I want to go back to the problem that I alluded to at the very beginning of the talk, which is this tricky issue about AD and functional array languages. So here's the problem. The fundamental promise you're supposed to make in an AD system is that the derivative program should only cost a constant factor more than the original program. But array indexing seems to violate this. Indexing itself, we expect to be an O of 1 operation, but the transpose of indexing takes a scalar and produces a one-hot array full of zeros, and that seems to be an O of n operation. You can imagine trying to get around this with compiler optimizations that turn one-hot arrays into in-place updates, but I've never seen a convincing solution that really guarantees you the right asymptotics. The embarrassing thing is that imperative languages seem to have an edge on us here. In an imperative language, you just emit a mutating update for the backward pass, and you get the right asymptotics. So in DEX, we manage to get the best of both worlds. We have the right asymptotics, and we preserve parallelism. And we do this just using the writer effect. So we do emit mutating updates in a sense, but they're monoidal associative accumulator updates, and so they don't actually interrupt parallelism. The accumulator effect really hits this nice sweet spot where it's sort of more machine-oriented than pure functional constructs, uh, but it's still more algebraic than a straight-up imperative program. So you get uh, in-place updates without sacrificing parallelism. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in questions.